Good evening, I'm Daryl Stranger, and this is Face to Face. Our guest this week is Kevin Chief. Kevin is Anishinaabe Métis and a member of Pine Creek First Nation in Manitoba. He's the co-founder of the Winnipeg Aboriginal Sport Achievement Centre, a former politician and a square dancer. He was first elected to the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba in 2011 before stepping away from politics in 2017. Now, Kevin is a public speaker and advocate for young Indigenous people focused on removing barriers and creating positive change. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us here on Face to Face. I've got to say, it is an absolute pleasure to be sitting here in person with you. Yes, thank you for having me. And it is, it is great to be in person and doing this together. So we'll start kind of with, with your current ventures. And um, you're the co-founder of the not-for-profit organization, the Winnipeg Aboriginal Sport Achievement Centre, uh, or WASAC for short. Yep. Um, so describe a little bit what that is and, and what the organization does. Well, WASAC, we started WASAC in 1999. Uh, two close friends of mine, one Pino Pisano, who is with the city of Winnipeg, and the late Ron Chartran, uh, Métis leader. And the idea of WASAC was to provide sport, recreation, and cultural activities to children and young people in, in Winnipeg. And we wanted to connect it to school. So we wanted to extend the school day of young people. So the goal of WASAC has always been not necessarily making better athletes or cultural performers, but mm -hmm. trying to assist in helping schools graduate young people, uh, give them summer jobs, and then help them access bursaries and scholarships for, for post-secondary. And so we use sport and recreation and cultural activities as the tool. And we got a huge lift in 2002 when the North American Indigenous Games was hosted in Manitoba because people right. saw the beauty, the strength, and um, how phenomenal um, an Indigenous-led uh, sport, cultural um, initiative could be. And mm -hmm. so uh, we've been able to build momentum off that since. So when kids get involved uh, with WASAC, are there certain messages or, or lessons you're trying to teach them or maybe just certain goals during their time there? Well, primarily if they're younger, we're trying to make sure there's programs like, you know, lunch hour and after school and summer enrichment programs. But as they, as they get older, as they get into junior and high and high school, we're, we're constantly reminding them that they're a role model, that they have a natural ability to create and influence change. And so one of the stories I share is uh, me and a good friend of mine, Chris Henderson, who went on to be the Southern Grand Chief of Manitoba. We were about seven years old. Chris was about eight. So this is like 40 years ago. It was a long time ago. And we got on a bus in the north end of Winnipeg. And when I got on the bus, we saw the bus driver. I sat at the back of the bus, and Chris said, do you see the bus driver? Go look at the bus driver. So I looked at the bus driver. It came back. He said, can you believe it? The bus driver's Aboriginal. We can be bus drivers. And it wasn't until we actually saw a Native person that was a bus driver that we really believed we could be bus drivers. And so one of the things that we know is that in any resiliency model is that we need role models. And young people look up to younger people. And so the, the WASAC has always been driven by youth running and leading all of the programs. And so we try to showcase the talents and gifts of young people, but put them in positions where they can really, they can really lead and be ambassadors for our community. Right. Well, that's certainly fantastic stuff. And, and WASAC also works closely with Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose. Um, and, you know, we've seen WASAC nights with the Jets and Follow Your Dreams Day with uh, the Moose, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just get bigger and bigger every year. Why is that relationship so important as well? Well, one of the things that WASAC has done well is that we've created partnerships, partnerships with northern remote communities, partnerships with the public education system. And one of our longstanding partners was True North back in the day, even before the Jets were here, like 20 years ago with the Manitoba Moose, because Mark Chipman, the, the owner of, of uh, the Jets, as well as, as the, the CEO of um, True North, he also had a vision of providing and removing barriers for low-income children to participate in, in hockey and in sports in general. And so we became friends 20 years ago, and we developed this partnership. And we thought, you cannot talk about the history of Canada, you can't talk about the history of Manitoba, without talking about the unique relationship with First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. 
And I've, I always think that we're at our best when we celebrate, when we celebrate who we are. So we have a collective history, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. So we thought, well, let's, let's showcase the gifts and talents of our children, our youth, and, and the stories of our elders. And let's do it in the loudest barn in the National Hockey League. And so it's turned into this amazing celebration with this incredible platform. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to Mark and his leadership and the team at True North for partnering with us all these years and be, helping us showcase these incredible stories of achievement and excellence in our community. Mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, um, you know, Wasak goes into remote communities and, and that kind of thing. There's not a lot of organizations that actually do that, um, especially the remote indigenous ones. So why does Wasak do that? Well, we saw that we were making a difference in Winnipeg with like partnering, you know, with the city, with the province, with the federal government, with schools, with, with the private sector like True North. Mm -hmm. And we felt that a, a group of us wanted to learn um, from isolated and remote communities. We wanted to learn about the struggles and challenges that young people have, but we also wanted to learn about the amazing things that happen in these communities. And so we thought we're good at partnerships. We're good at building relationships and based on trust. And, you know, my, my career has been a lifelong career in supporting Indigenous children and youth. And so we reached out to communities and we started to, started to partner with them. And, you know, when COVID hit, um, it was really devastating, of course, for all of us. But it was really, really hard on people. And there's a group of elders who came here at Christmas time. So they're going to be away from their, their family and loved ones during Christmas. And they ended up uh, Buna Bonabi. First Nation and ended up in staying at a place in the North End. Mm -hmm. And so I called up Mark. I said, you know, we got elders coming in from one of our partner communities. We we're thinking of putting care packages together. So we got like jet slippers and, and jets mitts and toques. And then we got a bunch of Wasack stuff and a bunch of welcome to the North End. Mm -hmm. And we got to go there and, and try to provide some, a, a touch to these elders who treated us so good when we went into Bunabonabi for the first time. And so mm -hmm there isn't a, a program or initiative that we do that we don't think about trying to make sure that young people, no matter who they are, where they live in Manitoba, that we can support them. And that's, that's worked well for us and we've learned a lot and we're, we're quite grateful for that. Now, uh, getting back to uh, more sports specific, uh, describe how important sports was to your life. I mean, how has that changed as you grew older? Well, one thing we know is that and I learned this myself, is that if we don't give young people something positive to belong to, they don't wait for us. Mm -hmm. Someone will seek them out. And I got a sense of belonging uh, primarily on the basketball court. I could shoot a basketball better than most people. And although I grew up with a single father who ultimately passed away from alcoholism when I was 18, uh, we grew up in a little bachelor pad and grew up like a lot of young, um, a lot of families in the North End, we were quite poor. But I always got a sense of generosity because every time I shot a basketball, my school's name was stamped on my chest. And so, and then there's, there's things that I got to learn. So my love for the game kept me in school and made school more fun and interesting. And right. so, and then I got amazing coaches. I was coached by some of the best people in the province. And then it was enough to keep me to graduate high school and then go on to to university and I was the first in my family to both graduate from high school and then go on to post-secondary. And then I had this amazing network. I got to travel the country. But I think about all the people who helped me, you know, my dad, my family, and all the coaches and teachers. And what's amazing about people like that is they never ask for anything in return. But what I think, if, if I could do something that would make them proud, is to try to give back to children and young people in the same way that they gave back to me. Mm -hmm. And w one of the most effective ways I found to do that was through the Winnipeg Average Sport Achievement Center because I, I understand that not all kids are going to be able to shoot a basketball like me. So we thought, well, let's use sport, let's use recreation because then that gets you into all sorts of low organized games and activities. And let's use culture and let's introduce young people and let's try to manifest those natural gifts and talents that we see in our community every day. And so my hope is that the people who supported me see that and are proud. And one more thing here, just touching on that, why do you think um, sport is so important to kids' lives, especially Indigenous kids? Well, I think it's because it builds in those values in a really good way. It builds in a, a sense of belonging in a good way. 
it, 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 it helps you point to role models. So it, it helps you to see other people and, and look up to somebody in a, in a positive way. I think sport also allows you to feel a sense of generosity for your school community and for the broader community. And I think one of the things that we often see in athletes, uh, particularly, is that they're proud of who they are and they're proud of where they're from. And for a lot of us, you, me, many people who work at ABTN, there was a time in our life where we weren't proud. We weren't proud of who we were. Um, probably collectively carried a sense of shame. And so when you see Indigenous athletes or Indigenous role models, they're not only excelling on a court or on the ice or in their particular field. They, they always naturally move to doing things and being a role model for things like you know, speaking against racism or being a champion for, you know, women's rights or, you know, tackling issues of poverty and addiction. And so they have a dual role that they often play. And so uh, I think it's a great way to inspire and to, sh to share stories of success and achievement. Yeah, we do need to take a, a short break here, but uh, coming up, we'll touch on Kevin's uh, political career when we come back. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Wasak co-founder and former politician Kevin Chief. Now, Kevin, you were an MLA for years in Manitoba. What drew you to politics? You know, I asked this question, um, and it, it's, it's stuck with me since. One of my good friends and mentors was a guy by the name of Yvonne Dumont. He was the first lieutenant governor, Métis lieutenant governor in the history of Manitoba. And I asked him that question. I said, how do you know when you should run politically. And this was even before I had an interest in mm. politics. And he said, you know, Kevin, I don't think that's really a decision for you to make. You know, he said, but if enough people approach you and they think you're someone who can represent their values and, and, and speak on behalf of a community of people, you should consider it. And I got approached by that time by Doug Martindale, who's a longtime NDP MLA and Someone who's inspired me in my political career was Judy Washalisalis. I like to call her Judy Washa Chief Chief. Um, so she became a good friend of mine. And I actually ran, the first time I ran, I ran federally. And during that time, I got to be quite close with Jack Layton because we were one of the only elections, it was a by-election in the country. And I lost the safest seat the NDP had. I actually lost that seat to, uh, to Kevin Lamaru. But, you know, I was reminded by Jack about all the wins mm -hmm. I got from running. Many Indigenous people for the first time voted. Many Indigenous young people um, volunteered in my campaign. Um, I encouraged parents and grandparents to take their kids when they went and voted for the first time so they could, so they could inspire their children mm -hmm. to vote. And I have lifelong friends, people like uh, Jim Thompson, um, who continues to work with me today. So I, I was fortunate that I got to run in another election the following election was in the provincial government, and I, I, I ran and was successful to represent Point Douglas, the North End, which was a, a neighborhood that I was born and raised in my whole life. And so it worked out well for me. Mm -hmm. And in, in fact, you were actually tapped as a potential NDP leader, and um, you know, some say you could have been elected premier. Um, you know, why, why did you stop? Well, I had a young family. In fact, two days before the election that I had just recently, we had just recently won, although I won my seat, we had lost government. And, and my son was born two days before that. So I had, at that time, I had a brand new baby. His older brother was only two. And my oldest was only, at that time, four. Oh, wow. and, and so I was in politics already for six years. I loved my job. Um, it's going to be the best job I ever have representing the north end of Winnipeg. But I realized that it was, it was a lot for my wife. It was a lot for my in-laws. And, you know, although my dad didn't have a lot, he was always there for me. And so, tough decision. But I decided to try to, it'd be better for me to try to spend time with my kids, work at being a dad. And, being a husband and so I left a job I loved and I, I'm fortunate that the work I continue to do um, a lot of the work I was doing as MLA feels very similar to the work that I do now so I'm pretty fortunate that way. 
Yeah, and I mean, nobody can fault you for the decisions there and, mm -hmm. and leaving. So um, did, did you find what you were looking for in politics? I did. You know, I try to tell people that, for me, first off, representing the North End, a, a, a neighborhood that I was born and raised in, um, is, it made everything I did feel so special, including standing in the chamber and representing that neighborhood. I loved it. Um, and I always tell people, if you have whatever your interest is, whatever you're passionate about, you should consider politics. Because if you're passionate about Indigenous rights, your voice is needed at the table. If you're, if you're passionate about farming, agriculture, your voice is needed. If you're passionate about women's rights, your voice is needed. And if we don't have that diversity of voices sitting at a cabinet table or speaking in the chamber or in the House of Commons or at City Hall, you know, there's a large group of people who aren't represented properly. And so I think people should consider politics. I mean, you can make it and bring um, the things you care about most, but you'll never learn more. You'll never learn more than when you are in politics. It, it's a huge opportunity to learn and expand your network and be able to, to be able to give back to, to people who've helped you. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it was a wonderful job. And um, yeah, so. And, and just before we go to break here, um, now that you know what it's like, would you consider running again? You know, I'm asked that question often. And every time I'm asked it, I, I really think it through. And, but here's, here's what my challenge is, and it's going to continue to be. Like, I'm getting older now, you know, like I'm 47 years old. I'm not that young. But my son, my youngest, is only in kindergarten. And so, and his brothers aren't much older. So it's hard for me to see, you know, a path back in. And then I love what I'm doing now. You know, I love the work that I'm doing now, and I'm, I feel fortunate and blessed to be able to do it. So right now, I, I can't see that happening. But who knows? All right. Well, we do need to take uh, one more break, but stay tuned. We'll find out what's next for Kevin when we come back. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Kevin Chief, a well-known former politician, youth advocate, and not so well known, quite a good square dancer. So, <laughs> square dancer, can you tell us about that? Well, my dad, uh, my dad used to be a musician. He passed away when I was 18, but he 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 used to sing uh, old time country music, gospel music. Always had a fiddle in the band, and you know, so uh, traditionally, a lot of teams in the square dance community will name a square dance team after an elder or someone who's passed away, and so. One of my uncles uh, asked me, his name's Sonny Delaron, and his wife Terry Delaron asked to name a square dance team after my late father. And I said, I, I would be honored, but I didn't know how to dance. I didn't know how to jig. And so he said, oh, you should learn how to jig. And so I met some wonderful people, uh, Jessica Lavalle and Fred and Elaine Ranville, the grandparents, and Kayla Lavalle. And I started to learn how to, how to jig, and then I joined square dancing. And Man, I took a lot of pride in to be known as Canada's only jigging politician. <laughs> but one of the reasons I love square dancing, the first is it's multi-generational. So you can see grandparents dancing with their children and grandchildren. You could see, you know, a dad dancing with their daughters. Like that's what our team is made up of. Um, but the other reason I love square dancing is the music. It, 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 it transcends age, it transcends uh, cultural background. And so, you know, I love going out to treaty days and and Métis Days, wherever they are, and are going to events that they're trying to raise money. And, you know, you could be Polish, Ukrainian, Filipino. People love the music. And so it's been a very good way for me to give back to my community. And I, man, I love it. I, um, it it's been good. It's been very good for my soul. It's, as we say, it's good medicine for me. And mm -hmm. that, that was hard during COVID because we weren't able to come together and gather and but, you know, guys like Alan Gray Eyes were really good at finding ways and the Manitoba Métis Federation, uh, President Chartrand found ways to get artists and dancers opportunities to, to perform during, even during COVID virtually. So very fortunate. And uh, on, on another note here, um, another sad legacy for many Indigenous families is, is addiction and, and alcoholism, like you had mentioned. And um, now you've shared your own struggles publicly. Um, what is your story with, with that? 
Well, alcohol has been absolutely devastating in our family. My dad passed away from alcoholism and our family continues to struggle with it. And one of the most heartbreaking things I realized is that when I wanted to get sober is that I was going to have to create distance, some distance from my family. And, and I spent a lot of time in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, it, was, it was part of my upbringing. And, you know, one of the regrets I do have as a former MLA and as a former cabinet minister is I had a, I had a big platform to be able to share my struggles with alcohol because a lot of people in my neighborhood were struggling. And, but I know you can't live in regret. And I have uh, my nephew, who's only a few years younger than me. Um, he served time in Headingley, and he was in a program called the Winding River Program. And I got to go visit him and the guys in this program and share my, my sobriety story. And I got a lot of strength and courage from my nephew. And I came out publicly and I thought, you know, alcohol is a gateway to a lot of other challenges that we face in our community. And I wish we could, we could share an Indigenous perspective and not share the lived experience of alcohol, but it, it's part of, of our community. And so I appreciate you asking the question, Daryl, because I, I do feel any time that we can have conversations about it and bring it up, and although I have regret that I didn't do it sooner, I've committed to the idea that I'm not going to live with regret because I, there's things I can still do today. And so if I'm asked to go out and share publicly, uh, if I can do interviews like this and there's an opportunity to mm -hmm. share my own struggle, I just want people to know that um, I got a lot of hope from people's sobriety stories. In fact, that got me through weekends of staying sober. I realized that I didn't have to walk the journey alone. There were many people that were willing to help me as long as I was willing to put the effort in. And my last point to anyone there who's struggling and families who are maybe seeing loved ones struggle is constantly remind them there's a solution. My solution for me, my journey was Alcoholics Anonymous with the support of my good friend Chris Henderson. And then I was able to transition away from Alcoholics Anonymous because of my love for square dancing and culture and, and getting into the community and going to events that were alcohol free. That was my journey. But that's not everyone's journey. But what I want people to know is there is a solution for you. There is a journey, there is a path for you. And I slipped many times, and you might too, and loved ones might see that. But, you know, persevere. And, you know, if you get through it, man, your story will inspire others. And mm -hmm. so, I appreciate you asking and allowing me on face to face to to share a little bit. Yeah, definitely great answers and great advice indeed. And um, what's next for Kevin Chief? Well, for me, I think I'm gonna keep trying to do what I've been doing. You know, I, um, I we have a lot of gifted and talented Indigenous young people out there. We have incredible leaders that are doing amazing work. Um, part of what I get to do at Wasac or True North or is, is to share stories like uh, Leticia Spence, who indigenized the Jets right. and Moose logos, the, one of the first people to do it. Uh, you know, she's from Cross Lake and from Opasquiac. And if you look at now the incredible talent of someone like Leticia, there's been many sports, professional sports teams now indigenizing their logos, including non-teams. So, you know, the Cree Choir that, that just performed at the, at the Jets game, the like the reclaiming and revitalization, revitalization, promotion of our language. I, I love being part of that and sharing that in a broad way. And so I'm just going to keep trying to do what I've been doing, which is my lifelong career has been supporting and working with children, indigenous children, and young people. I'm going to continue to do that. Uh, that is all we have for you today. Kevin, I want to thank you so, so much for coming in and, and sharing your story. And it was truly a pleasure for, for us. Um, we're always looking for new guests. So if you have any suggestions, please email us at news at aptn.ca. And this show and past episodes are available as podcasts. You can find those at aptnnews.ca slash face-to-face podcast. Thank you for tuning in to Face to Face. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a great night.